So I believe um, the next panel, um, the everyone, all the speakers for the next panel are right here. So welcome everyone. Um, just to, uh, you know, just uh, take, uh, introduce it a bit. I think Sanjeev likes to call it landmines. <laughs> so I put it a little mildly, but, um, and in fact, a recent uh, IBM Institute uh, study finds that 90% of Indian startups fail within the first five years of inception. Um, so why do such a great number of them fail and what makes the rare 10% stick? Um, so our upcoming panel discussion will ponder over these questions and it will also dive into what it means to actually do a venture in India. You know, how we're faring on the innovation scale as well as the interesting trends that we are seeing, um, especially in including the convergence of our passion for enterprise as well as our pride and heritage. So I guess uh, we have all very different speakers and um, to pose these very critical questions to them, we have uh, Dr. Madan Mohan Rao. Hi, Madan. Hi, everyone. Cheers. I hope you got a good cup of coffee and tea with you. I have limbo pani. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so Madan is a research director at Your Story Media. He's a charter member at Thai Bangalore and committee member for CII Knowledge Summit, um, a graduate from IIT Mumbai. Interesting. I always thought you were from Bangalore. So no. yeah. yeah. OK, OK. And uh, University of Massachusetts um, at Amherst. He has written 15 books on management and culture. Why does your story tell us you've written only, uh, ed edited only five? doesn't even tell us about this. <laughs> and um, he's been a spokesperson in 90 countries around the world. Interestingly, and this is the part that's most interesting for me, he's also an editor and DJ on world music and jazz. So while this conversation may not have that, um, it's very interesting to know that this is also something that you work with. So over to you, Madan. I'm not going to take more time and welcome everyone. Yeah, thanks. Are you going to introduce our other speakers as well? No, I, I, I think it's best you do that. Yeah. Okay, fantastic. Okay, good. Uh, we have uh, an outstanding panel uh, ahead of us. Uh, we have with us Sri Vardhini Jha. She's a professor at IIM Bangalore. Uh, she's written a book, co-authored a book on uh, called Decoding, uh, uh, Shifting Orbits, Decoding the Indian Startup Ecosystem. Uh, we also have with us uh, Kaninika. Kaninika has also written a book called The Indic Factor. Uh, this is about startups in the uh, cultural space. It's not just about startups, but startups who also mix entrepreneurship uh, with it. And uh, we also have with us Sanjeev, who's written a book. Uh, he's been on the entrepreneur and the investor side, and he's written a very good book on uh, scaling up from pony stage to unicorn stage. So that's a very topical theme right now. So we're going to delve right into these questions, and we also take some questions, I guess, uh, towards the end from the audience. So um, my first question for each one of you is, uh, uh, as Pooja mentioned in uh, her opening remarks, innovation is a big hot topic in India these days. So my first question for you is, uh, how important is it for a startup to be truly original? You know, many startups are using sort of a, a me too copy paste model, which has worked very well in other countries, but one could argue that the customer doesn't really care where the innovation came from. They just want a good product or a good service. Some of your thoughts on Originality versus sort of adapting, tweaking models from other countries. Let's begin with you, Sanjeev. Sanjeev, over to you. Thank you, Madan, for getting me on this program. I think at one level, all the problems are the same across the world. You are you are building a hospital or you're building a school and you are selling it to a consumer. So my sense is that one doesn't really need to reinvent the wheel. What has been done by the predecessor economies of US and China can very easily be transported to India. And we are seeing that in a digital economy where innovation moves from US to China to India. However, I think the originality lies in execution. A very good example is uh, Flipkart's early days in India's digital ecosystem, where there were no payment platforms way back in 
2007, 2008, when they arrived on the scene. And they created this innovation of cash on delivery, which was never attempted at that scale anywhere else in the world. So a person physically uh, collects money from you. Till such time, the payment systems began to take off. So that would be my uh, initial thoughts that problems are the same anywhere in the world. Uh, we are lagging the rest of the world. Uh, so we have a lot of fundamental and foundational things to solve for. So don't reinvent the wheel, just adapt in execution. And the other thing that comes to my mind is what works in India is a full stack model. Because so many components of Indian economy are still work in progress. That you, if you depend on your environment to solve a problem from a particular part of the ecosystem, then you may have trouble in doing that. So one of the biggest innovation in India can be that you do it end to end. I think Reliance is a very good example of doing things uh, end to end so that you can really satisfy the customer without any breakpoints uh, in the middle. Those would be my some of the initial thoughts. Thanks, Sanjeev. We'll come back to some of those issues a bit later as well, but let me not turn that question to Sri uh, Maybe one could argue that as an academic, you're much more focused on maybe IP and these kinds of patents, filing, etc. perhaps, but uh, I'll leave that up to you. What do you think uh, is uh, the importance of originality for a startup, say, in India? Sri Yeah. Thank you. First of all, uh, thanks for having me on this panel. It's, it's a privilege and a pleasure to be here with such uh, esteemed colleagues. Uh, my quick thoughts on this. Look, I think um, entrepreneurship is new in India. I mean, relatively speaking, right? We have seen this, this whole entrepreneurial wave. Yes, traditionally we are an entrepreneur, especially certain communities have always been entrepreneurial. I'm talking about more of the the new age technology driven entrepreneurship, if we, if we could just qualify it that way. That's a fairly recent phenomenon, right? The last 20 years is when we have sort of seen this takeoff and it's progressing in waves, right? The first, the first wave of entrepreneurship is what you might call as, you know, copycat models, right? Something's working in the West, there's a market for it. So why don't we bring it here? Why don't we apply the same, same opportunity uh, or, or capitalize on the same opportunity in the Indian context, because there is a good 50 to 100 million uh, population that's very comparable to what you have in the Western world. And that's, that's again, a very significant number. So that's great, nothing wrong with that, right? So we, that's how we started. Um, now the key becomes, and, and that continues to happen, right? So the initial models were all, okay, um, you know, can we have an Uber? Can we, can we replicate that, right? When Ola came, it was Uber was already there. Uh, when Flipkart came, Amazon was already there. So I, we started out that way. And then now what we are seeing is that space is starting to get very saturated, right? And we, have, we are starting to evolve. Now we started there, but now we are starting to see more and more startups looking at what's a uniquely Indian problem. Right? So that, that's the transition that we are seeing more recently. Right? And the next part of the transition as we see it is, is really uh, the move towards more IP-based um, innovation-led startups. So it, it's, a, it's a journey, it's a transition. I wouldn't say this versus that, but yes, when you have an IP at the core of your organization, at the core of your firm, that will give you significant competitive advantage, not just within this particular market, but then it gives you significant advantage to be able to compete globally. So if we want to see uh, more and more of our firms being very competitive at a global stage, then we definitely need uh, the backing of intellectual property. We need novelty, we need originality. But that's not, it's not an either or. I think they both can coexist and they both should coexist. And the two types also require very different skill sets, right? When you're taking a business model from the West and trying to adapt it to an Indian context, 
what becomes important is speed of execution. Operations become very important, right? So that's a that's a separate skill set. Technology may not be technology is still important, but you're mostly using existing technology, plugging it together, putting the pieces together, and then sort of getting your operations up and running very, very quickly. Whereas when you talk about IP driven, innovation driven startups, you are pushing the frontier of technology, right? You're doing fundamental research, you're, you're doing breakthrough research. And that's a different space. And, and maybe we can come back to that later in terms of where we are with respect to research and so on. So my point is both are important. It's not really an either or, and they both serve a very different purpose. Very well said, Srivadhani. Definitely, this is a transition and both need to coexist. And I think this plays very well into the hands of our next speaker, Kaninika. Her work also looks at companies who work on Indian traditional culture and heritage, which also is a different kind of an IP. So Kaninika, in your case, what are some of your thoughts on originality of Indian startups and the importance of it? Yeah, thank you, Madan Mohan. And it's a pleasure to be here today uh, at the Bangalore Business Literature Festival. Uh, building on what Srivadhani said, in the space that I have researched for my book, The Indic Quotient, I saw a very unique uh, model. And to give you an example, uh, there is a um, startup called GoCoop, which means uh, what they do is work with cooperatives, handloom textile cooperatives across the country. And these are small clusters of weavers who did not have a platform to actually sell their products except for selling it to middlemen and traders. And uh, you know, I met with uh, uh, their uh, chief executive and asked him that which was his best selling product. And he said, it's the Maheshwari Sari. And so I'm just trying to tell you from uh, uh, anecdotally that when I visited Maheshwar to see that what kind of people actually use that platform, a technology that he's developed specifically to get these people who are third, fourth generation weavers, a lot of them not really uh, very well to do, not very so uh, with technology, but it's amazing to see what kind of problems unique thinking and original thinking can solve. And this is a problem very unique to India. You know, you have this third generation uh, weaver or farmer sitting in some remote part of India, and you have uh, entrepreneurs who are thinking differently to get them on board, get them to use technology to help them build on their income, provide better for their families and uplift the entire society, the entire community. So I think um, uh, there is some merit in uh, looking at problems uh, unique to this nation. Uh, we have, um, I don't think there's any other country that has so many handloom weavers, that has so much of indigenous uh, crop growing that uh, has been a legacy. Ayurvedic products, for example, if I can talk about that sector, again, so many people, so many entrepreneurs trying to see how consumers can benefit through some of the herbal beauty products or, or organic indigenous millets, for example, as far as food is concerned. So we have a space, uh, you know, in, in my book, I talk only about that space of cultural entrepreneurship, which is totally unique to India. So uh, I think that's, uh, and, and to sign off, I think I'll say that uh, Future Group, which was uh, one of the biggest, uh, you know, retail groups earlier on, maybe 15 years ago, uh, the founder Kishore Biani, it, in his book, It Happens Only in India, says that he started off with trying to sell white shirts, and he figured nobody wanted to wear white shirts in India. So, and he just borrowed this idea from the West because he thought, oh, white shirt sells, you know, everywhere in the West, the staple shirt for a man is white. And those stocks just lied unused, unsold for years for, with him. So I guess he talks about this, how consumers in India want to address their problems in a very unique way. There are unique problems and the addressing requires a little bit of uh, adapting to this environment. Thanks, Kaninika. Thanks to all of you. That's a very good opening round of uh, discussion. Thanks again to the organizers for keeping the best panel for the end of the day. No, just joking. All the other sessions were good as well. Um, my second question is uh, moving from origin to scale. 
We're seeing now so many unicorns and IPOs this year. I think 26 plus unicorns already this year, much more than any other earlier year. So my question for you is now, um, what are the broader implications of this uh, unicorn boom? Uh, one could argue it's very inspirational for uh, young founders, but is there a cautionary note also around this? And what does this mean also for the larger Indian economy? Who benefits and how do they benefit? Uh, how about you, Sanjeev? You want to start with that one? Yeah, sure, Madan. So Madan, I think, one big mega trend across the globe is uh, digitization of major industries. And the industry that started first was retail and then followed very quickly by transportation. And currently we are seeing digitization impact to every sector, including transportation, logistics, healthcare. So I think this is uh, a phenomena that is creating a lot of wealth. And the expectation is that on a $5 trillion Indian economy, a trillion will come from the digital economy, which is uh, emerging, which includes the Zomatos and the Olas uh, of the world. So I think one, uh, there is a huge opportunity for disruptors to come from having no legacy of a business or a business family. You could be a kid out of college and create a billion dollar company. Uh, because these segments are all being disrupted uh, as we speak. So there are a lot of uh, virgin territories waiting to be uh, penetrated. I think the other piece is that these unicorns create a virtuous cycle in that when there is a unicorn, a founder becomes rich. When he becomes rich, he becomes an angel investor, when he becomes an angel investor, he gives advice and money to future entrepreneurs. So this creation of unicorn is spawning the next generation of entrepreneurs. It is also one of the biggest driver of employment. We are an investor in Ola, we are an investor in Big Basket. These companies employ tens and 20,000, 30,000 uh, people on their payroll who are involved in servicing their consumers day in and day out, right from a CEO to the boy who delivers uh, food to your doorstep. So I think big impact on uh, employment and GDP, big impact on entrepreneurship uh, at scale. And then the latest trend, as I think was being mentioned by Sri Vardhani, that Indian innovation is now beginning to go back to the world. So while in the first wave, there were IT services companies that had made India proud. Now there are software product companies which are taking Indian talent and leveraging that to build software products for the globe. So India's stature, I think on the world stage is getting to the next level. Uh, then was the case when we were an IT services provider, which one can argue was more a replication and execution uh, excellence. But I think now you're also beginning to see innovation from India uh, for the globe. So this is a time for a lot of reinvention, especially traditional businesses which are in manufacturing, retail, have to reimagine their uh, business model. Uh, because as you would have noticed in the United States, retail has been disrupted hugely by folks like uh, Amazon. So I think it's no different here. And the good news is that 
the real growth is yet to come. You already have uh, companies worth $10 billion created in terms of companies like Zomato and Paytm. But the digital penetration currently is still sub 10% in most industry categories. So this phenomena is a very, very scalable uh, phenomena. Lot deeper than what we have seen as yet. It's just a pilot uh, which has been rolled out and the real scaling is happening uh, as we speak. Thanks, Sanjeev. The best is yet to come. That's a very good, encouraging, optimistic note for all the entrepreneurs in our audience. And uh, I think Srivadhani, some of the points he made about in your book, you talk about the employment generation of many of these companies, these startups, especially during the pandemic era and so on. But I'd like to hand it over to you now. What are some of your thoughts on the implications of this unicorn book? Srivadhani? Yeah. So unicorns and IPOs, I'm sort of going to club the two and talk about it, right? Um, see, I think... Uh, what I find very exciting, which is unfolding currently, is that we, we see a lot of these companies going IPO. And I think for a long time, one of the challenges in this ecosystem has been lack of exits, right? Uh, we, we saw a lot of VC money coming into the ecosystem right from about 2000, um, 2011, 2012 onwards. We have seen consistent investment into companies. But then people were starting to question, okay, how do we exit? Right? Uh, where are the acquisitions? Where is the, how is the route to IPO? And there was also a worrying trend where we saw a lot of companies domiciling in Singapore or, or you know, going to the US because there was this thing that, okay, it's easier to list there, right? It's easier to uh, go IPO there. So there was a little bit of that flight happening out of the country, which was a little worrisome for, uh, for India and, and, and for our economy. Now, the good thing is there have been some tweaks and uh, in, in, the, in the regulatory framework and so on, and companies are able to list in India, which is, which is I think, a, a very, very welcome uh, development. Uh, it's a very positive development. It gives uh, liquidity to investors. It, it gives a, a complete... ...in the academic... Uh, parlance, we call it entrepreneurial recycling. So you have all this, these resources, both financial as well as other uh, intangible resources that are plowed back into the ecosystem. So it sets up a virtuous cycle. Um, so so these, this, is, this is a great uh, um, development. The only cautionary note that I would have in all of this is, you know, we need to see several of these companies turn profitable and stay consistently profitable. I think that is still something that's, that's yet to happen. And I do hope that, you know, as Sanjeev said, we are still on ground floor. We have, we have a lot of room to grow. Uh, I do hope so, but I, I will wait and watch. I will, I will wait and watch, um, you know, in terms of internet penetration, we are, we are already quite there. Uh, how saturated is the market? What is the headroom for growth? There are sort of uh, some questions around that, but yeah, I think it, it's looking great, but I would like to see some of these companies sort of become bellwethers, consistently delivering profits quarter on quarter and sort of sustained uh, profitability. And, and that is when I would really sort of feel like, okay, you know, we have arrived. Thanks, Srivadhani. Again, growth is possible. Growth is good, but it, almost, it, it should also come with profitability. That's a very good observation. So in that case, Kalinika, what are some of your thoughts on this whole unicorn boom and how, what does it mean for the cultural sector, which may, be, which may not be as digitally penetrated perhaps as what we just heard about? Kalinika? So uh, again, I would like to share uh, an example uh, and I would like to look at the yoga wear space. Um, surprisingly, it's a U.S. brand, Lululemon, which posted uh, profits of three billion in Canada and U.S. Uh, in 2020, just because they promote yoga wear and yoga pants and all things around yoga. And they're the entrepreneurs I spoke to because I, that was one of the subjects that I was looking at, um, uh, given that even in India, there's a huge surge in uh, the demand for yoga teachers. The Association for the Chambers of Commerce says that there are double-digit growths on a yearly basis in the demand of uh, yoga teachers and yoga 
uh, uh, you know, uh, studios. So we see that um, there are startups and entrepreneurs I want to, I speak to, they want to do a lot because they see that uh, kind of potential. But yes, there is a long way to go. Uh, there, the whole startup ecosystem and also the demand for um, cultural products and services is growing really fast. A lot of entrepreneurs are coming up in that space. And I like to say that when we do well in that area, for example, you know, if an Indian brand becomes really large in the yoga wear space, it also does a lot for the Indian soft power. So it is not just uh, from the economical aspect, it's also for, as far as the cultural space is concerned, a lot to do with the Indian soft power abroad and being recognized for some of the amazing things we bring for humanity. Thanks, Kanilika. That's a very good round of uh, common questions for all of you. I'm going to ask now some questions specifically to each one of you. So my next question now is uh, for uh, Sanjeev. Uh, Sanjeev, we talked about scale just now, and obviously it is very easy for some sectors, such as software, digitally penetrated ones, to scale as compared to some other ones, maybe more of hardware kind of products, for example. So how should founders and investors set their expectations accordingly? How should a founder set his expectation when he gets into software as compared to something more tangible? Uh, how should an investor look at these very different spaces? Any tips, observations from your side, Sanjay? I think uh, more than different strokes for different folks. And you can think of investors and entrepreneurs in two buckets. One are the folks who are building businesses in scale markets. They are really chasing big mega trends. And within those mega trends, there will be a winner take it all type of uh, mentality. So payment system, e-commerce, uh, cab aggregator, these are all those very scalable uh, winner take it all industries where entrepreneurs will get a very high reward, but at a very high risk. And then there could be businesses which are being built in uh, niches, which is what Kanika would, was referring to. Those kind of businesses will have a different risk reward. They will be companies that will turn profitable much sooner. They will have very good return on equity but they will not be participating in big digital disruption. And therefore a different class of investors who like profitability, who like return on equity versus investors who say, we won't worry about profitability for first decade. Let's go for growth. Let's go for market share. And once we have consolidated the market, in the next step, we go for profitability. So I think you can pretty much put them in these two buckets, scale investors slash entrepreneurs and niche investors slash entrepreneurs. And you got to be very aware of what area you are playing in uh, because the rhythm of these businesses are very different. The metrics that you chase uh, are very different. In digital world, it is not wise to index on profitability, but more on unit economics uh, and growth, because you are saying that you are investing a lot of capex in terms of brand building to create customer recall and virality. So if you were to be looking for absolute profitability, uh, then you will not be able to build a highly competitive business. While in a niche bucket, I think you are absolutely looking at profitability and return on uh, equity. So most of the digital industry uh, that I am familiar with and I am in touch with is uh, in the former bucket where the outcomes are very big, but so are the failures. You could lose your entire capital or you could have a 10, 20, 30, uh, 40 times return on your capital that you deployed. 
Thanks, Sanjeev. I can see you nodding quite a bit there, Kanenika. I guess you agree with some of these points, and definitely in your sector, the scale question comes in a very different way. What do you, what would you respond yes, to? Some yes, of yes absolutely. And uh, I totally agree. There are people who want to um, take it slow, uh, and uh, especially I saw that in. Uh, 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 certain sectors where they are more of social enterprises. So social, they, they, the social commitment is so high, they want to do the best thing for the community they are working with, at the same time scaling up at a pace that is not destroying uh, the main purpose of their business. While in the others, we see a faster um, a move towards profitability and faster scaling up. A lot of times it depends on the vision of the founder and also um, how they want to proceed with the uh, uh, with what vision so you know there is uh, there are people who work on uh, in fact one entrepreneur which works with uh, indigenous farmers and uh, who grow millets etc said they are looking at the triple bottom line and didn't want to go for funding because uh, you know they're looking at planet people and product profitability together and so very socially conscious model and in that regard um, the the life cycle changes a lot so i think uh, it it differs uh, and in the sector that I kind of worked with uh, different met a lot of people in that space, they are a lot more slower um, and more sure actually about how they want to proceed. Okay, great. Uh, I have another question for uh, Shivadini and then we can take questions from the audience. Uh, my question for Shivadini is, uh, there's a lot of talk also these days about the triple helix model, how to connect government industry and academia and grow entrepreneurship in this particular way. So what are some of your observations on how this is evolving in India? I know I am Bangalore, you're right in the middle of all this action. So how are you seeing this collaboration of the whole ecosystem evolving? Shivadini? Yeah. So the triple helix model has been, has been around for some time. I mean, in, in the academic circles, in, in journal publications and so on. So it's really about how, like you rightly said, Mother, how government, industry and academia can really sort of come together to, to, to nurture the innovative ecosystem in the country, right? How can you come up with breakthrough innovations and take it all the way to commercialization, right? Or, and each of these actors mm -hmm. play a very unique role in that. Now, if you look at what is happening in the Indian context, there are, I mean, of course, the government is doing what it's, it can do in terms of uh, R&D investment, right? If you look at how much the government in, invests in, in R&D in India, it's about it's less than a percent of the GDP, right? And, and most of the, the top economies, the most innovative eco economies have anywhere between two to 3% of GDP going into R&D, right? So our investment is, is, is not sort of on par with the top innovative economies, if you will. So that's one piece. But having said that, I mean, we are a resource starved country. I mean, there are, there are many, many, uh, demands on the limited resources that we have. So it is what it is, and it's sort of gradually increasing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you also look at the role of the, the private sector, the industry itself, right? Um, the industry is not spending enough on R&D either, right? Now, if you look at the gross domestic expenditure on R&D, even though the government is, is investing less than average when you compare globally, the government spending still accounts for about 63% of the gross domestic expenditure on R&D. And the industry is only contributing about 37%, whereas on an average globally, that number has to be somewhere in the high 60s. So the industry also needs to pull its weight in terms of investment into R&D. Right? So that's, that's sort of one part, just, just the input, input aspect. The second is about the collaboration between government, academia, and industry. Now, the, the government and academia have been working fairly closely for a long time, you know, and, and a lot of academic institutions are funded by the government. You have the CSIR labs, you have the IITs, Indian Institute of Sciences, and so on and so forth. So, so there is that funding going into these, these institutions. So there is a little bit of uh, close interaction there. Now, we have also been attempting to build a scaffolding between academia and industry, but that is somewhat broken, right? Now, what happens is at, in, in academia, there is, you know, uh, there are researchers, there are doctoral students and so on and so forth. They do the research, there is an innovation, there is, let's say there is an invention. Now, 
the invention is at a lab scale, right? There is, there is probably a working prototype, et cetera. Now, if you want this to become a commercially viable product, it has to go through several different steps, right? There is a technology readiness level. I mean, this, is, this was created by NASA, right? It just looks at technology and says, okay, how ready is it? How close is it to being commercialized? And it's, it's a scale ranging from one to 10. Now, most inventions that come out of academia are at two, three, whatever, not more than that. But for you to be able to commercialize, it has to move up, right? And for, for industry to be in, in, interested or to be able to take it and take it to market, it has to be at a slightly more mature level. And this scaffolding has been a problem, right? Either the academia has to push that readiness level forward, or the industry has to make an effort to sort of take it from a more nascent stage and pull it up, or you need intermediaries who work on this scaffolding. So that piece is, has been a struggle, right? And, and there are a lot of initiatives where, uh, you know, there are um, research parks where um, th there's research happening and there are industry connects and so on. It's moving, but it's moving slowly and, and not as fast as we would like it to, right? And th there is still some, some issues there. But what really worked out in the recent COVID uh, scenario is, I think it was the crisis situation, right? So everybody, all hands on deck. So suddenly this whole system worked beautifully during the COVID pandemic, right? So you had, for example, NCBS uh, in Bangalore, the, um, the, the, the research center, coming up and saying, okay, this is how we could solve the problem. Industry, whether it is the Mahindras or whether it is Biocon, whether it is other startups, they sort of rose to the occasion. The government led by the um, principal scientific advisor's office. So it worked beautifully in terms of how they orchestrated, you know, a variety of technologies ranging from uh, testing kits to, to um, you know, disinfecting chambers and what have you, right? And, and even vaccinations and so on. And so I think what it showed us in the last one year is it, this is possible, right? You can actually accomplish uh, industry, academia, government collaboration. But of course, we were looking at a crisis situation. So everybody rose to the occasion. So now we have to take a step back and see how can we make this systematic? How can we institutionalize this, right? And how can we make this work in normal times as well, right? So it's, I think what we see happening is it's possible, but maybe a little bit of rethink, tweaking some of the incentives either at the, uh, for academia or for the industry to sort of have them come together. Stop. Thanks, Sivadini. Uh, I think I'll stop my questions and take to the audience questions. In the Q&A window, there's one question for uh, uh, Sanjeev, which is uh, you talked about unicorns and how they need to focus more on growth for some time before becoming profitable. The question for you is, how long does one need to wait before they become profitable? Uh, how long before they become sustainable and start chasing a profit? Uh, any comments on that, Sanjeev? Yeah, my sense is, uh, Madan, that I think about a decade. It takes uh, two, three years to get your product market fit right. It takes another three, four years to get your unit economics right which means you are profitable at a transactional level. And then it takes another three, four years to amortize your brand spend. So around a decade, if you have the holding power, which in a typical digital business would entail at least a billion or $2 billion of uh, investment, uh, that is the time when the men separate from the boys. So, so that is the period where you want to focus a lot on growth and, and also customer experience, not only growth, but very high net promoter score and uh, customer experience. So I think focus on these two. Uh, and by that time you drive competition out of the market and then you can gain pricing power uh, and turn profitable. Thanks. Uh, Kanilika, in your case, how long before profitability in the cultural sector? You mentioned Just you a moment. Um, yeah. uh, Sanjeev, actually, you've done something because of which we can only see your eye up. 
So oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Okay. Can you recall some thoughts on how long to profitability in some of the companies that you work with? I think it's very varied given uh, that there are a lot of different uh, models in the cultural space and uh, each one differs uh, very widely in uh, the way they uh, are structured and how, what kind of problems they're solving. So I think, yeah, um, maybe it would be similar to what uh, Sanjeev mentioned. Um, I think it would go uh, to a, uh, between uh, five years to 10 years in some cases. Okay. Uh, a question now for you, uh, Shivadini, uh, from the audience. I've been in a quick response from me for this one. Just, which is, just uh, a gentle reminder only. We have five minutes, four okay. actually. So if you have any audience questions also that you want to take, you could check that and see when you want to. Uh, and then we. Yeah. So the question for the professor is uh, business schools also have entrepreneurship courses. So how well can entrepreneurship be taught? You know, there's this old saying that it can be only done to be understood, but how much is, how important is teaching for entrepreneurship? Shivadini? Yeah. Good question. I teach entrepreneurship, so I'm going to defend it, of course. <laughs> well, no, I think um, entrepreneurship, you know, research is, uh, when, when entrepreneurship research started, uh, it was all trait-based, you know, the whole research paradigm was focused on understanding if there are unique traits that distinguish entrepreneurs from non-entrepreneurs, okay? This was back in the 80s and 90s. And that by 2000s has reached a dead end, right? So the trade-based entrepreneurship theory is dead, right? And today the predominant uh, view is that entrepreneurship is a method, much like the scientific method. You know, entrepreneurship is a method. It is a method that can be taught, right? That's the, that's the direction in which research is, is, is uh, heading. So when we say, when we teach entrepreneurship, you know, we cannot teach somebody how to arrive at a great idea, right? Because let's say, you know, uh, somebody's brainstorming, somebody comes up with an idea. It is so dependent on that person's unique experiences, who he or she is, uh, what they know, how they connect the dots, right? And, and also ideas become better as you, as you ideate, right? Over a period of time. What we tell them or what we teach them is how do you go about it so that, you know, you, you increase your odds of success. We cannot guarantee success, right? We cannot, when we teach entrepreneurship, we cannot say, if you do this, 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 then your company is going to be successful. Nobody can do that, right? But what we teach is a scientific method. Right? Um, whether it is based on effectuation theory, whether it is based on the lean startup method, what we teach them is how do you go about this in a very structured manner so that, you know, if, if this is not going to work, you should, you should know it sooner rather than later, right? It's about fail fast, fail cheap, and then move on to the next thing, pivot, right? So we, we tell them how to go about it in a structured manner. So they, one, increase the odds of their success. Two, they, they avoid common mistakes, right? And if they are able to sort of quickly understand, get the pulse of whether or not they're going to get to product market fit and they can do course corrections quickly. And the way it is taught is also different, right? It's not lecture-based. So we try to bring experiential learning so that they actually get to experience what that journey might be like, even if it is during a, a 10 week period, right? So I, I'm going to stop there in the interest of time. Yeah, great, thanks so much. We're almost out of time now, but uh, there's uh, one last question here for Sanjeev and I'm going to piggyback on that and ask the other speakers that also. Question for Sanjeev is, which books did you read which helped you in your journey in uh, as an entrepreneur, as an investor? And I'm going to ask Karinika and uh, Sivani to recommend maybe one or two books for our audience other than your own books for uh, entrepreneurship studies and so on. So Sanjeev, uh, we'll take a first crack at that. What books? helped you in your journey? I was most impressed by Jack Welch's uh, writings. I forget the name of the book. He's not written too many. Uh, you can actually Google them. And uh, I think I learned a lot about leadership principles from Jack Welch's uh, writings. And then the other one that I liked a lot is Good to Great which begins to research companies that excel versus those 
uh, that don't uh, those two really were uh, significant impressions on me thanks sanjeev kanika what books should our audio, audio, audience be reading about entrepreneurship other than so your for own? me um, there's this book called recasting india by hindol sen gupta which talks about social entrepreneurship and how you know and his stories are uh, pretty much are so inspiring and also in a way different space as like you know my sector is very niche into the cultural space he's talked about a lot of underprivileged people you know um, who have set up or uh, bringing solutions of remote communities in india so i think that's an amazing book for any entrepreneur to read it's very inspiring and also gives a total different angle to the kind of like i'd said in the beginning the problems that india faces and the kind of solutions that can come up shivadini two books eric rice lean startup definitely must must read for all entrepreneurs and i would also recommend some um, you know stories of entrepreneurs like shoe dog phil knight um, of nike and there's also another book mcdonalds i i can't remember the name but they are they are great reads i mean every entrepreneur should read this just to know what they are getting into right i mean these are some inspirational stories and the lean startup is a great book for method Sanjeev Kanika Shivadini thanks for a fantastic panel discussion thanks to the organizers for putting this together and thanks to all of those in the audience for asking these questions and staying till the very end of day 2 uh, we'll be putting together a summary article of this whole conference uh, at the end of the festival so do check that out but for now uh, once again a big round of applause for our panelists uh, and uh, back to the organizers pooja over to you yeah thank you so much and thank you everyone madam it was really nice the way you also you know made sure that you asked an individual questions the overall way you conducted it and managed to ask so many questions from everyone so thank you everyone thank you sanjeev shivadni and kanika thank you so much and everyone who's tuned in please tune in even tomorrow tomorrow's our last day and we have some fantastic sessions even tomorrow so goodbye and see you soon bye thank you cheers thank you fellow panelists thank you, thank you everyone bye bye, bye. bye.